You are listening to Heroes Never Die, your one-stop spot for all the latest news, Overwatch League results, and mishaps in Overwatch. Here are your hosts, Totally Drunk and Edinar. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Heroes Never Die, your one-stop spot for all things Overwatch. I'm your host, Tumulty Drunk, and tonight on episode 102, we take a look at what's happening around the watch, discuss the latest hot community topics, share our takeaways from Overwatch League Stage 2, Week 3, and so much more. But before I get into the news and introduce you to my co-host, I just want to take a moment to thank everyone who is hanging out in the Twitch chat tonight, and any repeat listeners that we do have. Of course, as always, I do have someone here with me to help break everything down. Right in the highs and lows of the week that was being a Florida Mayhem fan, we have Adenar. Adenar, congrats on, you know, winning your bet against my Overwatch League Network co-host Spider. Uh, how, I, is, how has your week been? All right, my week... All right, I have a week of ups and downs. So, the, the Mayhem, I won my bet with Spider. And I was ready to throw in the towel. Like, straight up throw in the towel. towel. We're down 2 nothing, And then somehow we reverse sweep the, the fuel in one of the craziest last seconds of a map I've seen in Overwatch League with uh, Tavik. Somehow staying on the point and getting everyone in there for, uh, uh, for the win. But... You know, that was the high. The low is I have, I told you this before, I uh, had a small accident. I'll show that. Um, I, I I can't play competitive Overwatch because uh, I had six stitches put in my thumb because I am a horrible cook and I sliced my finger open. And I can't use the space slash jump bar. And I know I can, I can rekey it, but I don't want to learn to rekey and then in a week... <laughs> go to be like, oh, okay, now go back. So I'm just taking a week off competitive, which kind of sucks, but, you know, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. I've uh, I've taken the non-competitive to non-competitive season to watch more Overwatch League. So that's a win-win. Um, so how, how has your week been, Totem? Um, I mean, I, I haven't really been gaming that much just because, you know, as you know, like, the back cap started back up here yesterday, so not only am I watching Overwatch League, but I got, you know, NA contenders, EU contenders, and I'm gonna attempt, I'm not gonna watch every game for Korea, but I wanna watch <laughs> at least one specific team, uh, or just a few, so I, I'm not, I don't know if it's gonna be too much or not enough, I, I don't know, but there's a ton of Overwatch esports going on, and I am trying to consume as much as I can, within the time that I have without burning myself out and, you know, still saving enough time for me to do other stuff, because obviously I do operate three Overwatch podcasts and I kind of, you know, need the time to prep for all of that. Uh, but, you know, it has been a pretty busy week just around the scene, both within Overwatch and Overwatch Esports, so let's go ahead and jump into the news. Uh, so we do have an update for you guys on the rework for Hanzo. And we do know that the developer team is going to begin to work on, uh, you know, new animations. We've got visual effects and sound work uh, with this upcoming rework for Hanzo. And Jeff Kaplan took the, the forum to let everyone know that this rework is scheduled to begin uh, post Brigitte release. So they are hoping for a PTR sometime dropping in April for the Hanzo changers. No, last month we had kind of discussed some of the things that they have been testing internally in regards to Hanzo, you know, stuff that didn't quite work out. Uh, that included, like, a barrier piercing arrow. Uh, they had changed scatter arrows so it, like, wouldn't split up the floor. They That didn't really go that well. They also had, like, a different type of reload mechanic where you could basically, like, sacrifice your normal arrows in order to reset your special arrows. So, really, like... Scatter Arrow has been, like, a pretty hot topic for the community for, really, all of Overwatch, like, since the game uh, had been released. And, Scatter Arrow. And for, for those that aren't as familiar with Scatter Arrow, why don't you just let them know why that has kind of been one of the more 
needed abilities in the game for the community. Okay, so Scatter Arrow is a, an ability that encourages you to not aim at your opponent. It's like, hey, you know what you should do in a first-person shooter? You should aim at the floor and try and kill them that way. And it, it will kill you without actually being aimed at. And I think that's the thing that pisses people off the most, is they get scatter arrowed and you're just like there's nothing i can do about it like like he aimed at the floor beneath me from so far away that the scatter arrows just hit me and it's one of those broken abilities that wasn't as broken as the mercy res but now that mercy res has been taken you know taken to town it's like okay now we can break fix the next broken ability which is the scatter arrow and yeah, I uh, the amount of times I've died to scatter arrow, where you're just like, this is pointless. Why am I dying to scatter arrow? <laughs> is the bane of most Overwatch players' existence. Yeah, Hanzo has always kind of been uh, the bane of some people's existence because there was a time where when he shot his arrows, it was basically like he was shooting not an arrow, but basically like a giant log at people because you would get clipped around corners just with the mm -hmm. basic shots. And with Scatter Arrow, you know, that's an ability where it even has, like, one hit potential even on some of the tank heroes in the game. So, you know, a well-placed shot. And I'm going to say well-placed because there are times where, you know, you're going to miss some of those splits of Scatter Arrow. But, like, if you're able to one-shot a tank in Overwatch with just one ability, that just, I don't think that really has a spot within the game. And that's why a lot of people don't like Hanzo, I mean, other than... The fact that Hanzo mains are dirty, and, you know, we no one really likes snipers because they don't play the objective. Whatever. There are good Hanzos, there are bad Hanzos. Mainly they, bad. Ma mainly bad. <laughs> I mean, that's also true for Widow. Um, but I'm really curious to see what exactly this rework is uh, going to bring, just because, you know, we've already heard about all these other iterations that they already tested that didn't work out, that didn't stick, so... I really don't know what direction they are going to take with Scatter Arrow, whether it is, you know, just giving him a new arrow or just changing that one ability just as a whole. Uh, but speaking of hero changes, we need to talk about one that has been, uh... I'm trying to think how I should describe this, because there were a lot of people that were complaining about the Sombra rework that they had just recently done, and how everyone was worried that Sombra was going to be an absolute must-pick in the meta, and then we'd start to see, like, this hero, like, lockdown uh, ability with her increased hack and all of that. Well, the outcry from the community, uh, you know, voice and narrative displeasure, we are actually going to be seeing some changes uh, that are going to affect the recent somber buffs that hit in late February, so just a couple weeks ago. So the Overwatch lead designer, Jeff Goodman, uh, he took to the forums, he gave some insight on what we can expect to see, and he says that anytime Sombra's hack is interrupted by damage, Hacken will go on cooldown for two seconds. Uh, with this change, Sombra players will have to be more careful about choosing when and who to hack, instead of just holding down the button and waiting for people to miss and or reload, etc. Uh, he says that there's currently a 0.1 second window at the end of hack where it can't be cancelled via line of sight or other effects. That exists so it doesn't get broken by small line of sight blockers like, you know, signs and like light posts in the game, which have kind of always been that way with some other abilities that they also tweak, like self destruct and roadhog hook. Uh huh. And. You know, they just, they don't want that to be a problem, so they're trying to speed up the update rate uh, for her hacking so that it is more responsive in check-in for those fail conditions. So the combination of these things should mean that uh, it should just be more reasonable to respond to a hack targeting you. So, you know, I have to say, like, this kind of throws me off because there was such an outcry on the forums, not just from, like, the general community, but some of the pro players as well, saying, like, okay... You know, this is gonna be this is gonna be Sombra's gonna be a must pick. You know, she's gonna be in every match, and we have not seen that. I know looking at overbuff, kind of looking at the stats and her pick rate, she really doesn't see a whole ton of play. 
uh, when you compare her to some of the other Flink DPS until you get to Grandmaster. So, you know, you're talking about the highest level of competitive in the game right now. Mm -hmm. And Dive right now is still the prominent meta that we see, you know, both in Overwatch League and Contenders. Not to say that we haven't seen Sombra played in Contenders, because we have, but it has failed every time that we have seen Sombra. So take that for what it's worth, given that sample size. So, like, really, like, right now, what is the problem with Sombra? Like, is she just building her ult too fast? Is the, uh, the tightness of the spray, like, just too consistent with her DPS? What do you think is the, the outcry over? I mean, I think the outcry over Sombra, at least so I'm, you know, goldish player. I think the outcry is, honestly, her hack is too quick. You don't have enough time to react to a Sombra hack. And I think even if you, like, the, the changes they made, while they might not be drastic, they're enough to really kind of tech her down a peg. Because you can train yourself to listen for Sombra hacks better. Uh, you can't train yourself to, uh, you know, get unavoidably get out of a Sombra hack. Uh, and, and now with the, the two-second cooldown to her hack when she's interrupted... Well, like, if you train yourself to hear her hack more, you can interrupt her more and get away easier. So this will, I mean, this affects, so I'm a tank main, basically, and Ham, uh, Sombra is the bane of my existence when I'm a tank. Like, mm -hmm. I play Orisa and Ryan, and if she's behind me and I'm hacked, I'm, I'm done for. And But there's nothing I can do about it. She has no counter. Right, the way she is right now, she has no true counter. Like, yes, people can say, oh, Farah or McCree is a counter, but uh, just because she has a stun doesn't mean, or McCree has a stun doesn't mean it's a counter to Sombra. Uh, but just being able to interrupt her and reduce the, or increase the cooldown of her hack is a counter in itself. So by putting this in, they created a counter on every character to Sombra, but without making her obsolete in the same process. Uh, the only other thing I could do is they could increase the time of her hack, but then you start getting into the, you know, all right, it's here, now we're going to lower her hack, then we're going to raise it, and then we're going to lower it again, and you just get into a tug-of-war game with her hack speed. And by doing this, it gets rid of the need to do that. It just creates more, you have to be more aware of your surroundings um, when it comes to having a Sombra around. Yeah, absolutely. And we do have a few updates in regards to Hero 27, Brigitte, and, uh, you know, uh, Michael Chu, the lead Overwatch writer, is taken uh, to Twitter to answer some fan questions involving the lore of the new hero. So, uh, if you want to submit a question, you can do so by uh, tweeting the Play Overwatch Twitter uh, with the hashtag uh, Brigitte Lore. And, you know, you can just... I'll, I'll post the, uh, the hashtag in the show notes just because I know, based on the pronunciation, that people are going to misspell it. <laughs> so... Uh -huh. That's just how it is, uh, but that's B-R-I-G-I-T-T-E lore. So, uh, we, we don't have a word on when this blog for the Q&A is going to go live on the website, uh, so, you know, keep that in mind to try to get your questions in for the Q&A sooner rather than later, otherwise you might miss the cutoff. Uh, but something else that we saw on Twitter was an Inside Overwatch tweet that revealed Brigitte and her concept art giving us like kind of like an insight look at the development of the character. And really like the biggest note out of all of that was we do know now when Brigitte is going to come out in Overwatch and that will be on March 20th, so that is next Tuesday. Now, mm -hmm. as a new hero, it is worth noting that there will be a waiting period before she is available to play in competitive play. So you know, you don't have to worry about people trying to learn her on the fly and competitive, like, day one, so I can calm some people's nerves. Uh, but really, like, we finally have a date, you know, it's only been, like, a couple of weeks, uh, at least for testing. 
So I'm sure we're going to go more in depth with Brigitte and uh, just her impact in the game here on next week's show, just because it is still pretty early on and we don't know where exactly the meta is going to kind of shift, if at all. But, you know, it does seem like, you know, having her in the game, you, Spider, you don't play her at a top 500 level. Because there probably yeah, aren't even there aren't even five hundred people on the PTR, so I already I mean, got you. <laughs> does Spider play anything at top five hundred level? I mean, I know Spider doesn't bet on the fuel on a top five hundred level, <laughs> but you know that's just me. Yeah, that that, that this is definitely true. <laughs> top five hundred by default. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, but Adonar, is there anything in particular uh, in regards to the lore or just like? the impact that you expect to see from her that you want to talk about? Okay, so the from the lore perspective, I'm kind of disappointed, and this has been long running, is we haven't seen like a, like a, a short, an animated short in a long time. I mean, we got one at BlizzCon, right? For the Reinhardt was at BlizzCon. And I think that was the last one we got. But, I mean, we should have gotten one for her, but we haven't. Really, we haven't. And I want a, a, an animated short on her or something relating to her. Because right now, all we know about her is, hey, here's Torbjorn's daughter. All right. And I'm Reinhardt's, you know, granddaughter or goddaughter or whatever. And it's just one of those things that's like, I wish they would give us more other than, okay, we have a Q&A, which is awesome, but an animated short would be better. And I think that's what we need. Um, unless they're working on a movie, then do not give us any animated shorts until we receive a movie. I'm good with that. Well, you could be waiting a while on that one. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like definitely animated shorts are... You know, a pretty uh, pretty big thing for the community. Everyone is one of them. But, you know, kind of how they've been laid out, like, in terms of a timeline. You know, we're going through, like, very large lapses of just content in that regard. But, you know, we do occasionally uh, do get, like, the, the origin stories or digital comics, things like that. So it hasn't fallen completely on the wayside. It's just not the, like, the avenue that people are wanting because... Everyone has just fallen in love with the write-in and just the animation of these shorts. And that's why everyone has just wanted to see those over everything else, because there is more to really uh, retain, I think, from those uh, types mm -hmm. of media. But, switching up things, let's go ahead and talk about what is going on right now within the Overwatch League. You know, obviously, Overwatch League, the new hotness. I mean, we're going to be talking about it pretty much every week for the remainder of forever. As long as it's going on. <laughs> so. uh, until we're done with the show or Overwatch League is done. Whichever comes first. Yeah, wh whichever. Uh, but an update for the San Francisco Shock. We do know that they have signed two new players. Uh, so this will bring their roster up to 11 players. They signed uh, a support player as well as a DPS player. They had signed Architect, who is a DPS player who had played for x6 gaming he is a genji main and a projectile player i know he's played Farah and doomfist in the past and then they also picked up moth from uh toronto esports that is their support player and for those that don't know if you're not watching contenders toronto esports is actually the academy team of the boston uprising this is a lucio main so you know he's gonna be looking at uh maybe replacing deck or maybe be in a substitute, I don't know. Technically, I think he's an upgrade over Dak, being one of the better tier 2 Lucius out there, and Dak hasn't really been all that great so far within the Overwatch League. But, uh, we do have some other player news, and that is that, you know, two of their other players are going to be turning 18 soon. So we have Sinatra, Mr. 150k, he will be turning 18 here next week and will be eligible to play in the league on March 22nd. And then Super, who has been basically hailed as kind of like their jack of all trades, is going to debut ahead of Overwatch League's third stage. So, 
you know, the Shock, they have been pretty underwhelming, I would say, as a whole, for the yeah. Overwatch League uh, so far. They have looked pretty bad in the Mercy meta. Uh, they've looked a little bit better in this current meta. But, you know, Sinatra being their Tracer Specialist, you know, he's going to come in. And, you know, I have to ask you, like, do you think Sinatra will come in and replace Dante on the Tracer immediately? Or is this going to be something that they're just going to start to, like, kind of work in over time? Um, there is literally zero chance Sinatra does not come in and replace Dante. Like, in my mind, you're not going to... All right, Sinatra very publicly made 150000 Got like a hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year contract. You're not paying someone that much and not putting him in the starting lineup day one. You're not paying someone that much to sit on the bench. Now, that's not may not be because be because of skill. Like Dante has performed extremely well on Tracer, better than I think even the you know the San Francisco Shock expected, especially all of us expected, but. He's not going to keep Sinatra on the bench. Dante may switch to somebody else so they can try and feel like, hey, we're going to get you in the starting lineup. We're going to put you in there. You're going to feel wanted. But I still think Sinatra will uh, put Dante on the bench, um, especially with Architect coming in too. Because Architect is going to be like the Genji Tracer combo is uh, a, an age old you know, Overwatch pairing between the two. And you get both of those. I mean, a lot of these signings made no sense to me uh, because this is, uh, it's called the Dallas Fuel problem. It's going to be like, hey, let's just sign a bunch of DPS and see what happens. Like they signed Architect, who is amazing and deserves to be signed by any team, but like they had plenty of DPS, especially with Sinatra coming in. So I fully expect Dante to be on a different team soon, very soon. Stage three, I'm thinking, because, I mean, any team that has excess tanks is going to call the, the, the San Francisco Shock and be like, listen, we need Dante. Here's a tank. Here's an extra off tank here, you know, something like that, because that's where San Francisco Shock is lacking right now is, you know, t main tank, off tank. Uh, even maybe semi healer, but let's see how Moth does. Um, but Dante will be starting for a team, probably in stage three. I just don't think it's going to be the Shock. Well, you you say that Shock have a fuel problem, and I would actually disagree because in the fuel's case, the players that they have signed for DPS overlap their hero pools, and on the Shock <laughs> side, they don't. You know, they don't really have yeah, a Genji yeah. player right now. Baby Bay. You know, he mostly plays the Soldier 76, uh, the Widowmaker. I mean, he does flex onto projectiles sometimes, but he's not really known for it, whereas Architect is more of a specialist for that role. That being said, you know, Sinatra, yes, I know he is making 150000 We really don't know what the other contract numbers are for this team or what the baseline is for a lot of these, what people consider, like, top-tier players, basically. Mm-hmm. But really, like, Dante has really been the unsung hero for the Shock. It hasn't really been all on Baby Bay. Baby Bay's looked good in spots, but he hasn't really been the one that has been consistently putting in the performances like Dante has. So I, I am absolutely worried that Sinatra is just going to come in and Dante is just going to be left behind because of that. And then with Architect, you know, Baby Bay has been their shot caller, and I'm hoping that that isn't going to be like the downfall for Architect being like just on the bench at that point because I want to see how they do run in that dive composition with Architect and Sinatra or Dante, whichever Tracer player that they do pick up. But I think at the end of the day, when I look at the team and Sinatra being brought in, like I don't think this is as big of an upgrade and as big of a deal as so many people are making it out to be. I know Sinatra is arguably probably the best tracer in north america that's really not saying much because north america isn't known for their tracers and the best ones are only like 15 or 16 and sinatra you know he'll be 18 
And, I mean, we all saw the World Cup. We saw Sinatra kind of uh, got out-dueled, basically, by St. Bielby, you know, so there is that, and, you know, he can make up all the excuses in the world, but I, I don't consider Sinatra to be, like, one of the top tracers in the world. I think he still falls behind a lot of the other uh, tracers out there right now. That being said, though, whether it's a big upgrade or a minor upgrade, I, I don't think that will be the sign-in that... or the addition that's really going to impact the team as big as Super coming in, just because Super does have a very expanded hero pool, which is going to open up so many other possibilities for team compositions for the Shock here in the future. But I'm excited to see how they uh, work all the pieces in, pieces in, and hopefully moving forward we will see some more substitutions from the Shock, because that has been something that has been extremely lacking for them in every game that they have played so far in the Overwatch League. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Shock need, you hate to call it an overall. There's a lot of fan favorites on that team. Like, between Baby Bay, Dante, you know, Sleepy even has, you know, his own fan base and stuff like that. But it's one of those things where, yeah, you can be fan favorites, but if you're not winning, the team's going to replace you or they're going to do something different. And I think this is them, the San Francisco shock being like, okay, we need to make a difference. We got quality players. Now we're going to bring them in. We're going to play them. We're going to figure out something new and kind of start fresh in stage three. They're, you know, they're a team that will in stage three, they will improve from what they are from stage two and stage one. You know, I fully expect them to do, I'm going to call it the the fusion jump uh, where from stage one to stage two fusion really stepped up their game and have been playing a lot better. And I think the shock are going to take the same route. I think the shock are going to take a big jump from stage one to stage two because they did three very, very important additions to their team that kind of make their team whole Uh, Four really with Sinatra architect, super and mom. Uh, I think those four additions kind of remake the face of that team. Um, unfortunately, I do see Baby Bay probably being one of the odd men out in this group. Uh, at times, not like he's never going to play, but he's going to be put be put on maps uh, sparingly, almost uh, when you don't have Architect and either Sinatra or Dante in there. So uh, they're going to take a jump forward, I think. I think in Baby Bay's case, it's ultimately going to come down to how much they value his shot call in and whether or not, you know, Moth could come in and be their active shot caller at that point if they are going to play him over deck. Uh, but, you know, talking about some of the other players in the league, you know, we, we have to talk about some of the fines and the suspensions that recently hit here in the past week. And, you know, there was an update to one of these players in particular that we'll talk about later in our hot community topics, but let's just go over the initial report. Uh, so we do know that three Overwatch League players and one coach are facing punishment for bad behavior. It's Taimu and XQC from the Dallas Feel, Tyron from Houston Outlaws, and Silk Thread from Los Angeles Valiant. And, yeah, you know, breaking league rules, so they're, uh, they're receiving some fines. So XQC's punishment is more severe just due to the fact that he is a repeat offender. He was suspended for matches and fined four thousand dollars for using an emote, and I'm gonna do air quotes on stream because it says in a racially disparaging manner. That was on the league stream, on social media, and on his personal stream. Kaima was fined a thousand dollars for using an anti-gay slur on his Twitch stream on January twenty-third, which didn't really surface. At least these allegations didn't happen until ESPN had published a report on it earlier in March. Uh, Tyron had received a formal warning for posting a xenophobic meme on Twitter back in February, uh, which kind of like joked about the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. And I know he donated like $1,000 to the Hiroshima uh, Peace Culture Foundation. That was after he had done like a public apology. And then Silk Thread. Uh, was fined a thousand dollars for account sharing, which I, I I don't know why people keep doing that. That that hasn't been the first time that's happened, uh, at least in the Overwatch League. 
But still, like, a lot of people looked at this, and they looked at the XQC situation, and they basically are just like, they're just scapegoating XQC. And I, I feel like so many people latched on to, like, that emote part of it, which we will talk about later, rather than the fact that, uh, just the realization that he is a repeat offender, haven't already been suspended here in the past for the Dallas View. Yeah, I mean, XQC, obviously, the, the big story here is XQC. Like, you have Taimu, who, you know, had the, the racial slur, uh, like, two months ago now. Uh, come out just come out recently and yeah they they find him just like they they find anyone else um you know and then you had uh let's see here uh kim uh you know you like you said he did something wrong he realized it he donated money beforehand they didn't punish him anymore he, they, like he did this thing and silk thread account sharing i it's one of those things that's the most preventable finds in Overwatch League, but people still do it for some stupid reason. So the, the real story here is it all falls on XQC on if he should have been suspended even in the first place, even being a repeat offender. Should he have been suspended and fined for, you know, posting Try Hard 7? Yeah, Try Hard 7 in, in chats. like. That's the big debate that's going down, and we're gonna and him getting suspended and fined and more, which we'll talk about later, is gonna be kind of like the overwhelming topic of a lot of the things that we talk about for the rest of the show in, in different news reports on like how it's handled, you know, uh, how fines are handled in Overwatch League, and how players can represent themselves and and stuff like that. So. I, you know, XQC is the big thing here. And whether you come on one side or another, obviously the decision, it doesn't matter because, you know, Overwatch League and the Dallas Fuel came down and they're like, here's what we're going to do. But it's a matter of if it was the right decision or not. Yeah. And another reason why a lot, there's been a lot of debate is just the fact that when you, when you look at like, the rules that are in place right now, uh, that are known to the public, you know, it's it's really not that detailed. So, you know, there's a lot of reason for concern whether or not these players need to unionize, like how exactly these punishments when they do come out, how they need to ramp up for repeat offenders and all that. Uh, but, you know, we will definitely touch up on that in just a little bit. Uh, but we do have... Uh, kind of like a follow-up from last week, you know, last week we kind of talked about the new additions to the Shanghai Dragons and their ETA. Well, we do have a new update for you guys, and uh, it's actually not looking very good for Stage 2. So, the new players are set to arrive by the end of March. We have Sky, Gagiri, Fearless, and Adu, and they are expected to have visa interviews this week and should be heading to Los Angeles after those visa interviews, so... Uh, this is more than likely going to rule them out of the remainder of Stage 2, which does end here pretty soon. That ends on March 25th, with Stage 3 kicking off on April 4th. So, at an art, like, we have four Koreans coming in to play for Shanghai. And I'm going to ask you the question that we actually posted for OWLN this week, and that is, do you field the Korean counterparts immediately, or do you just try to work them in... Uh, kind of like in waves or one at a time. What do you do if you're Shanghai in this case? All right. I don't care if they get off the plane 20 minutes before the match starts. You put them in. You put them in for morale for the team, not from the player perspective, but from the fan perspective. Uh, the fans want to see the new players. You literally have not won a stage or uh, won uh, a map in any stage so far. Like, you haven't won a series. You're not going to get any worse. You can't get lower than zero wins. Why not put them in? I, I mean, if anything f other than to boost fan morale, which then in turn boosts team morale, because, you know, the more fans you have, the more morale your team has, and the more it's like, you know, win one for the Gipper type of uh, situations. So, I mean, yeah, you put them in day one, 
and and you don't look back. Hey, plain and simple. Yeah, see, for me, like, I look at these editions, and no matter which one you look at, it is an upgrade on that edition. So, you know, it... I mean, it, it's something to say, like, okay, well, the dragons do have some synergy already. But, on the other hand, it's also like, well, they haven't really looked like they have that much synergy either. Yeah. Despite playing as much as they have, you know, as a unit. That being said, I feel like if they are going to kind of, like, incorporate things, like, you know, section by section, I think the best thing to do is actually to put Gagiri and Fearless in, which will be their, you know, tank and off-tank duo, and start with them. See how they mesh together, and then go from there. But, you know, knowing that this is going to be kind of like a mixed roster, having not only Chinese players, but Korean players, no matter which way you do this, you're going to have a bit of a language barrier. So the question is... Well, do you try to balance it out? Do you try to offset it? Because either way, you're still going to have players learning a different language on top of learning English for, you know, post-interviews, because they want all players to be able to do a post-game interview by the end of the season, which, I'll be honest, probably isn't going to work, <laughs> at least for season one. Maybe in stage two, but or in season two, by that time, maybe nope, everyone will drink. be able to. You pulled a me. I, I did pull a you. I don't... <laughs> I, I don't I don't have liquor by me right now. Ah, oh, fine. I'll I'll do it post show. <laughs> <laughs> well, regardless, you know they they haven't been speaking the greatest English by stage two, so technically that is accurate because uh, they're still having <laughs> issues through stage two. Uh, but I, I I think regardless of how you do this, Shanghai, you know they're they are in last place. They haven't won a game yet, and. They do have one upside outside of having new edition, so the cavalry is coming in, but they are also not ranked twelfth in the Twitch bits for the uh for the Overwatch League stream. They're actually in eleventh. I don't know if you've seen this. They're there is true. room. Yes. But can can you guess without looking who is the twelfth team? Because we've Ooh. already talked about the team. That's hard. Um the fusion. That would be my guess. The Philadelphia you, fusion. You, you would be wrong. It is uh, the San Francisco Shock. Really? That mm -hmm. I actually would have guessed like top six for for the Shock. <laughs> and you would be wrong. I was way off. Yeah, not not even close. Uh, but that is what it is. So looking at what is going on, like. Amongst the community, there's been a, like a lot of discussion, a lot of spice going on due to XQC and the yeah. emote spam, and whether or not we need a player union. So we're gonna go ahead and talk about all of those things when we touch on the hot community topic. So let's start with the big news this week, and that was that Dallas Fuel decided to release XQC into the wild. You know, uh, they mutually agreed to terminate the player contract early. You know, normally the player contracts are for one year in the Overwatch League. And, you know, they say mutually agreed, but, you know, obviously they, they just let XQC go. Um, so XQC for the Dallas Fuel, he only played six matches for the Fuel. You know, he did serve a suspension in that time, so they couldn't really prep having him as a main tank if he, you know, couldn't actually play because he was suspended, so there is that. I know Custa had actually mentioned that on his stream, and he didn't see, seem uh, too thrilled about that. Uh, but XQC like, did joke on his stream that he was more upset just due to the fact that he had to go out and buy new clothes due to the fact that pretty much everything that he owns has the Dallas Fuel branding on it. So... I, I mean, alright, so here's my theory on XQC. I don't, I don't agree with them basically banning him. He's not banned from the Overwatch League, but in reality, he's he's never going to play in the, the Overwatch League again. Um, he should never be in the Overwatch League. He's the type of character that will never learn from his mistakes. He knows he's kind of an a-hole. And... <laughs> He embraces it, and his his followers embrace it, and he brings them along. Now, granted, what happened to get him 
uh, kicked off or released from the Dallas Fuel is a question of, you know, did he deserve it for that specific thing or not? Pro- I don't think he should have been kicked off the Dallas Fuel or released from the Dallas Fuel for what happened. But it was only a matter of time before he did something that did get him kicked off. Um, he has no filter. He's not set up to be like this. He is a streamer. He's a very good, like, he, he, I'm not going to deny his ability to play. He's very good. Way better than I'll ever be. But he's very good. It's just the fact that he has that streamer mentality that he can say whatever he wants and do whatever he wants, and his fan base loves him for it. And he he encourages it and he embraces it and that's not what the overwatch league is about it's it's goes for in any sport he is more of a me 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 instead of a us 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 like you can't have that on a team and no team will sign him if he was ridiculously skilled like top player in his position maybe another team will would give him a shot but like most leagues, if you're skilled, good enough to play in Overwatch League, which he is, and you come with drama, no team's ever going to touch you if you're not one of the best. <clears throat> so, I mean, it's one of those things where it was bound to happen sooner or later. I had no problem with him other than the stuff he got in trouble for. That was like his antics, like the loud and the you know, the swearing on stream or something like that. I don't have a problem with that. Once you start getting into, you know, the racist territory and some of the bigoted things he says, then I have a problem with it. Um, he's just, he's a character. He, that's, that's the best you can say is he's just a character in the Overwatch League or was in the Overwatch League that they got rid of because they didn't want to do the head. Yeah, and just an update for the Fuel, they did make a new sign-in, and they picked up OGE, who is a tank player. He had played on Conbox, and, you know, he's more than likely going to act as the team's main tank. You know, that's whether or not Time is going to stick to the Winston. So oh god, please no. I, I would hope not, just because it's been pretty... It's iffy. been bad. Like... Alright, I'm going to say this about Fuel fans. Um not fuel fans, but fuel team is they need an overhaul. Their coach, Kai Kai, needs to go. <laughs> I'm sorry. When watching the game yesterday when I see AKM on Genji for a large portion of the uh large portion of the match, no, that was painful. Yet yeah, you have Taimu running in being like, I'm gonna jump in without anybody and just die. And then Akam's on Genji, and meanwhile you have Rascal on the bench, who is a legit actual Genji player, being like, well, I wouldn't have done that, and I probably wouldn't have died. Like, it's just one of those things where I, the decisions coming out of the fuel are baffling to me. Just, just baffling. Yeah, and really, like, to kind of go back to XCC for a second, I, I think, like, one of the things that, that that's kind of bugging people is the fact that, you know, people, like, players are getting punished for things that they're doing on their stream. And I know, like, you know, obviously Overwatch League is an absolutely huge, you know, esports endeavor. But it does lead to question whether or not there needs to be, uh, like... Should they, like, loosen the punishments when it comes to players streaming? Do they need to, like, outright tell players, like, okay, guys, like, don't stream at all? Do players need to just focus on that? Or should the streams just be used to kind of just, like, the players own devices where, like, that's where they go to just blow off steam? Because it, it seems like, to me anyway, that XQC, he couldn't, like, differentiate between the two. You know, he was always, you know, that stream persona at all times, that very erratic behavior... And, you know, obviously, things didn't work out. And it is worth noting, uh, since, you know, we, we don't know whether or not XCC will come back to the Overwatch League, but if he does, he actually has to get the League's approval to get picked up by another team. And mm-hmm. I don't know if the League will actually be okay with that at that point. You know, they might need to have, like, a waiting period. 
uh, just to like kind of calm things down, whether or not XQC can, you know, reform or just loosen <laughs> or just filter, I mean, filter himself just a little bit more or just get some sort of guidance uh, by someone, whether that is a caster or another player or whatever. Uh, but he, he definitely did struggle with trying to uh, just stay grounded, really, because he couldn't differentiate you know, being a streamer and being a pro player. And, I mean, let's be honest, you know, he can make a lot more money streaming, just, mm -hmm. you know, getting subs and donations than he could as a pro player in the Overwatch League because it was never a matter of whether or not he was good enough as a player because he was. It's just a matter of, is this drama and this, uh, this behavior going to be a good fit for our team or is it just going to cause problems and... You know, if if you bring someone on as a main tank and then he's suspended, like like you're you're pretty much SOL. Like you had to have someone else switch to that role, and it hasn't really worked out for the fuel. Yeah, I mean, you see this in sports all the time. I mean, I think one of the more recent examples is look at the NFL um, with Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow, good enough to be a backup quarterback on almost any roster in the NFL. No team wants to deal with the headache that is Tim Tebow. Like, he's, he's good at his job. He's one of the best. But is he that good that you want to deal with the headache? And he's not. So I don't think the Overwatch League would reinstate XQC. Just to say, I'm, I'm not dealing with this. Like, we don't want to deal with it. Um, and, you know be gone with you now if there was a union that might be a whole different story but there's not a union right now and there's nobody to fight on xqc's behalf which there probably should have been but there just isn't right now yeah absolutely so let, let's go ahead and talk about a player's union we'll we'll jump to that real quick so what we do know is that uh, former Overwatch Pro player turned coach Morte is actually looking to establish a players association for Overwatch. Uh, this is being helmed by a sports labor attorney, Ellen Zavian, who has worked on forming some of the other sports unions out there. That does include uh, the one that represents the U.S. women's soccer. Uh, and, you know, they're expecting, at least in terms of a timetable, to uh, have some sort of like press release and have it fully revealed in four months' time. So that's that's pretty quick. So the things that they're going to be looking at addressing include pay, insurance, uh, continuing education, and arbitration for grievances. So you know, as I mentioned, the like player behavior rules right now aren't like well laid out, at least in a public form. You know, the full Overwatch League rulebook has yet to be published, so we don't really know like what the writing looks like and you know what sort of details are in there, but I mean, based on what we know, like, there's really not a whole lot to go on, so that's why a lot of people are kind of, like, up in arms in regards to actual punishments and severity of these punishments that have been going on. So, you know, you kind of look at this, and, you know, there's already been some talk, like, do we go out there and do we find one of the Overwatch League pro players to lead this union, or do we just have a former pro player or, like, one of these attorneys to do it? Ah, uh, but... You know, there seems to be one name in particular that seems to be an obvious choice for a lot of people because he is kind of like one of the poster boys for the Overwatch League. And I hate to use that terminology, but it is true. A lot of people mm -hmm. want to see Jake be the player yep. to lead a player's association. And I don't know if you agree with that or if you have someone else in mind, but do you think that it should be one of the Overwatch League players to lead this union if it does in fact happen? Yes. I think it almost has to be a, an Overwatch League player who leads it. I think Jake is probably, like you said, he's the poster child. Um, uh, for lack of better terminology, he's he's the one where you're just like, when you s talk about Overwatch League like, with other people who watch it, you're just like, Jake. And they're like, oh, yeah, Jake. Very lively, very, you know, in front of the camera, um, very boisterous. And he doesn't hold anything back in a good way. He's not, he's not very loud and boisterous in an XQC way. Um, but I think Jake would be one of probably the top people to represent the teams. 
Uh, I I can't honestly think of somebody else. Uh, the other only other one I could think of is uh, honestly Muma. I could see Muma being one of those people, like a, a little bit quieter, but really like getting stuff done for them. But they need a union. They they have nobody fighting on their behalf. Like with this XQC thing, is they talk to XQC and his agent. Well, the agent's the one dealing with the the Overwatch League. So you have an agent for a streamer going up against a you know a Fortune 500 company, you know, and you're just like, uh, what do we do here? Like they need some form of representation. Now, a union could be beneficial. It could be useful and not useful. Uh, I mean, it could hinder things. But more than likely, it's it's gonna be beneficial to all the players uh, and the owners in the long run to get stuff hammered down. Like you want it more to be like for those of you who are big into other sports, you want it more like the NBA and less like the NFL. Like the NBA union and the league work well together, and the NFL they hate each other. So you need to find that fine line in between hopefully closer to the NBA style where, uh, you know, the players are happy and they're getting represented right. And right now they're just not getting represented right. Right. And it is also worth noting that the Overwatch League commissioner, Nate Nanser, has said in the past that he is open to the idea of having a player's union, but, you know, it was up to the players to unionize. Uh, yeah, so, he, you know, the, the Overwatch League can't be like... You guys need a union to play. I'm pretty sure that's illegal in some form or another. Um, but in regards to a player actually leading it, you know, you know, you mentioned two Houston Outlaws players. So, you know, I'm going to go ahead and think, you know, two other names that come to mind for me. Okay. And while one of them doesn't get to see play as often as pretty much everyone else we've talked about because they are starters... Uh, Siegel is another name that I feel like would be good in that role because Siegel, for the longest time, you know, as a former streamer, he he's actually taken a different path. I mean, we, we look at XUC. XUC didn't stop streaming. Siegel, you know, he gets picked up by the Dallas Fuel. He stops streaming altogether to focus on becoming a better player. You know, his focus isn't on making money there. It's to help the Dallas Fuel and he's just always been really down to earth. You know, he has a very storied history uh, with competitive Overwatch and Overwatch esports. And he is really a fan favorite. And I know a lot of people aren't too thrilled to see him kind of being like on the bench pretty much full time, you know, for the Dallas Fuel. And, you know, we do know that he is kind of working on learning that off tank role for the Fuel uh, since, you know, he hasn't really been working projectile for the team as we had most expected. But. You know, Siegel is another name that is, like, more of a, like, homegrown name. I mean, a lot of people, he's a household name. A lot of people yeah. know who Siegel is, whether or not they follow Overwatch League or not, because they might have known him from, you know, his stream or Overwatch Esports in the past and close beta. And then, also on the field, like, someone else that I wouldn't mind seeing is another person that is very, you know, just upfront about most things, always happy-go-lucky, and I mean... You gotta look at Mickey. I mean, Mickey is one of those players who might not be the best for the role, but you can't tell me, like, you couldn't possibly see that. No, I could totally see it. I think we need to expand our search outside of Texas. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, I mean, I can see Mickey, but I can see Mickey being one of those, I'm, like, Mickey's the most lovable person in Overwatch. Like, you cannot be angry around Mickey ever i don't know if that's the best personality or trait to have when mm -hmm. trying to run a union um but if like the overwatch players are like we want somebody who's positive upbeat isn't always uh you know a negative nancy then i think mickey would be the way to go or you know we can just look to our korean overlords and have ryu jehan be the daddy of the union I mean, that's really the only other, like, name that most people know. Now, granted, I, mean, if, I don't if know if you want a Korean player to it. If anyone says Pine, no. I do not want Pine as the, 
as as the spokesman. But Ray Jehong, I mean, he wouldn't be a bad choice either. Because he has the respect. Like, you need somebody who has the the utmost respect of the other players. Mm-hmm. And he's, Ryu Jehong is someone who has that respect. He really does. Like, Jake has the respect of a lot of the Korean players and of the, you know, the U.S., Canadian, European players. Ryu Jehong has all that. So those, I think it's between those two. All right, well... You know, let's talk a little bit about, you know, emote usage. I I feel like we have to talk about this just because due to the XQC release, uh, we've kind of seen, you know, that other side of Twitch chat. I mean, I'm I'm not going to say the other side. That's not the right way to word it. But we saw the more cancerous side of Twitch Mm -hmm. chat really come in full swing. And, you know, we saw a whole lot of TryHard7 spam from the viewers after this had happened. And, you know, this meme had originally was meant as a joke whenever someone was tryharding in the game. Hence the name tryhard, obviously. And this has really, like, sparked another huge uh, community debate about whether or not emote usage in Twitch chat is considered racist or sexist. And, you know, the outrage over XQC and his suspension and his release from the field only further escalated things with these most recent games that have been played in the league. And, you know, I'm just going to say it outright. Like, I don't think that emotes are outright racist, but in certain contexts, they absolutely can be. Uh, You know, just as an example, like, we have seen times where Malik Forte is, you know, on screen and people do spam the tryhard. So some people tend to use it in, like, a a racist manner whenever they Mm -hmm. see a black person on the stream. So there's, like, this whole discussion going on right now, whether or not, you know, they need to just ban that specific emote outright on the stream channel, whether or not, you know, just the basic emote should even be allowed, or if they should just stick with the Overwatch League-specific ones that people have earned by, you know, donating bits to the League stream and whatnot. But really, like, people are, like, back and forth with this. We have people calling each other out for, you know when they're using it, and how they're using it, and all that. So I'm just curious, like, where you side, at least on this particular debate? Are emotes racist outright, or is it just in the context that people are using them in? It's uh, outright, no, they're not. Uh, I mean, they they really aren't. I mean, there's plenty of people who use the emotes, the Try Hard 7, not in a racist fashion. It's, it, it was the thing that got XQC and and all his followers in in trouble was they would spam it only when Malik was on on camera. Now the thing is, is let's say you get rid of the Try Hard Seven emote, they're gonna replace it with another emote. So you either straight up get rid of emotes, which they will never do. Uh, it's kind of one of the key things about Twitch is having emotes in Twitch channel. Um. You get rid of one thing, they're going to replace it with another. Bad people are bad people. People who want to do something racist are going to find another way to do something racist. It's just the nature of things. I don't think getting rid of emotes will do anything in regards to that. Like, Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't, I want people to be good inside. Like, and, and have, I want them to have the best intentions and I want to think the best about people. But when it comes to these, these emotes, it's like a lot of them probably don't mean it to be racist, but they want to feel included in a select group. And that select group in this case was the XQC followers. Um, I, I, I mean, yeah, it's it, it's a tough situation. Twitch and Blizzard are in a, a tough role on, on how they progress with this. Like, because, I mean, the last thing they're going to do, anyone who says to get rid of emotes is insane. They're not going to get rid of that. That will never happen. As Blazing Bob clearly <laughs> points out in our Twitch chat right now, emotes are going nowhere. But the intention of emotes is what's at issue right now. Um, and you're not going to get rid of that until you start getting 
Overwatch League players that can kind of put the kibosh on it on their own fans. Because it's not, nobody's going in to watch the Overwatch League who doesn't also follow other Overwatch League players individually. Like, there's not Overwatch League players spamming TryHard7 who are not, like, XQC followers Mm -hmm. or follow the whole situation. So what you need to do is you need to go to the players and you need to have them go in their personal streams and be like, okay, you guys need to talk to your followers and be like, you cannot do this. Don't do this, period. If you do it in the Overwatch League chat or if you do it in our in their own chat, you will get banned. Right. So. And uh, I just want to point out what Bob is saying. He says, people pointed out that emotes can be used, uh, right, can be like when fans are cheering in the stands. And, you know, you're always going to have that drunk guy yelling obscenities. That's me. <laughs> That's totally me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't think Twitch chat is ever going to change. And really, like, let's be honest. Like, when I'm, when I'm watching a stream, I mean, outside of a podcast or, like, one of my friend's personal streams, I don't care at all about Twitch chat. Except in this instance, like, I'm obviously paying attention to everything that's going on in our chat, and whenever I'm in someone else's chat room, but, like, when it comes to, like, a major outlet, like, one of the, you know, partner streamers that have a ton of followers, or the Overwatch League stream, that's just, it's too much to take in. You can't process that information quick enough unless you are maybe watching one of the reruns overnight. So, I mean, really, like, If you're not paying attention to it, you're really not missing anything insightful because Twitch chat is always emote spam, copy pastas, Mm -hmm. and just people call in, people platinum plebs, things like that. So you're really not missing a whole lot. So, you know, I'm hoping that maybe we'll see things die down a little bit with the TryHard 7 if they're just going to outright, you know, ban people that are spamming it or whatever. Uh, But I I feel like one way or another, they're not going to get rid of the emotes. Obviously, the Twitch partnership and, you know, donating bits to unlock Overwatch skins in-game for the Overwatch League isn't going to go away either, just because there's too much money on the line for that, and Blizzard doesn't want to throw away that at all. But let's go ahead and talk about the week that was inside the League as we look back at uh, last week in Overwatch League. So on Wednesday... We saw Soul Dynasty take on the Shanghai Dragons. The Dynasty took that one 3-1. to one. We have the Shock going up against the Fuel. The Shock won that one 3-0. to zero. The Gladiators took the Battle for LA against the Valiant 4-0. to zero. So, a clean sweep for the Gladiators. Insane. Nobody predicted that. Yeah, that was absolutely nutty. Uh, on Thursday, we saw Dynasty defeat the Fusion 3-1. to one. The Valiant swept the Outlaws 4-0. to zero. And then the Uprising swept the Dragons 4-0, so Shane High losing another map. Uh, on Friday, we saw the Spitfire sweep Boston Uprising 4-0. The Excelsior defeated Fusion 3-1. And then, the cap off Friday, we had the Outlaws reverse sweep in Florida Mayhem. Woo! So, such a good map. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then on Saturday, we saw the Glanders take on the Spitfire. And Gladiators took that one 3-1. to one. We had Excelsior sweep the Shock 4-0. to zero. And to cap off the week, we had Mayhem involved in another reverse sweep, but this time it went in their favor. They defeated the Fuel 3-2. to two. So, I don't know, let's, let's start with Mayhem. You know, they have picked up their second win of the season, and it was a roller coaster week for Florida. You know, they finished 1-1, one and one. they had reverse sweeps in both of their series, they were on the wrong end on the first one, and on the right end of the second. We got to see Tavik and Logix actually both popping off in the same series, which is a major turnaround from what we have mm-hmm. seen from the Mayhem so far this season. Uh, we got to see Zappis make one of the most dramatic entrances we've ever seen. Uh, I know I clipped that... Uh, in the Discord for our top plays. I don't know why I put it there. I felt like it was necessary because it was hilarious. It's one of the top plays. <laughs> it's, it Just was absolutely. <laughs> and they definitely acknowledged it almost immediately. Uh, and really, like, 
had to say, like, being on both ends of that reverse sweep for the Mayhem, it just really showed that mental fortitude of this team. And while they have struggled so far this season, one thing that you can't deny is that the Mayhem, regardless of their win record, always seem to be in that right headspace. You know, they aren't down on themselves. You know, they're keep they're going to keep putting in that work, and they always seem to uh, really just have a smile on their face, regardless of what their record shows so far. That being said, you know, they do have reinforcements on the way, so we can expect to see better things from them here, uh, you know, at, more than likely in, during Stage 3. I don't know if we'll see Zappis at least for Stage 2. Might still be a little bit too early on, but, like, I just want to get your thoughts on the Mayhem's Week, because they came very close to pulling off the win against the Outlaws, only for the Outlaws to bring it back on the brink. But, you know, that win against Dallas Field, regardless of the internal struggles, was a huge win for Florida. Yeah, no, Mayhem showed a lot this. Uh, a fan in me aside, they showed a lot. Like, in the match versus Outlaws, they showed, to me at least, and to the rest of the Overwatch League, that they can... They can hold their own with much better teams. Now, Houston is, uh, how do I put this politely, struggling a bit right now. They, they are tracerless. Yeah, they are not in what you would call a good situation. Uh, but they're still a good team. Overall, they're still a good team. And, I mean, they had to, the Outlaws had to reverse had to win three matches in a row to to beat them. Uh, that's a good sign. And then to come back and do the exact same to another team who has the the Dallas Real have a lot of skill. They're just mentally that team has checked out. Um, but the skill is there, and to be able to come back from what happened to them and be like, okay, we're down to one meter away from losing this match essentially, to winning the, the entire match. It showed a lot of guts. I mean, Logic is one of those, you don't know which Logics you're going to get. It's you're either going to get a dominant one or you're going to get a meh type of Logics. Uh, Tavik is always going to be Tavik. Um, but I think once they get the the reinforcements from the new signees in Stage 3, I think... They're probably, I'm not going to say, I don't have Grangers of, they're going to be in the playoffs. No, I don't think they're going to. <laughs> I think I think they will, though, move up into the middle of the pack. I think they're going to move up into the, uh, like, the Gladiators, Shock, Philadelphia Fusion, middle of the pack type level. Um, well, like, the, the Dallas Fuel and... Shanghai Dragons kind of go down towards the, the bottom. Um, so I liked what I saw out of them, but I mean, I'm also a fan. So it's, it's hard to really take me to them. Well, as a Florida fan, you definitely have to set, like, tempered expectations just based off of how things have been. Um, but I, yeah. I'm really hopeful for this team. Uh, at least going forward, I cannot wait to see Saya player. I mean, I followed him a lot in the Korean scene, so i that's the addition that I'm really looking forward to seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, you mentioned the Gladiators, and this is a team that has been on a rise. They soundly defeated the London Spitfire. So, you know, Fisher coming from the Spitfire to the Gladiators, goes up against his former team, and it was dominant. You know, the Gladiators had a huge week, they swept the Valiant, and then, you know, they beat, one, like, the Stage 1 champions in the London Spitfire, and, you know, I, I remember going on Fisher's, uh, like, Twitter timeline, and <laughs> there was something that was posted, and I, I almost died. I saw it, and it was just a meme of, like, despicable me, so you saw Gru, and he's like, we sell Fisher to gladiators, we make lots of money. <laughs> but Fisher carries, so we lose the gladiators. And then, you know, he's just looking 
Like, wait, what? <laughs> wait, what does that say? Yeah, no, it's, it's it was yeah, prices. <laughs> Big Fire's like, crap. What did we do to ourselves? All right, this sucks. We just lost a guy. We traded her away, but whatever. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, we had expected the addition of Fisher for the Gladiators as their main tank to have a pretty big impact for them. But I don't think anyone expected to see this much of a progression with this team in such a short amount of time. So, we have seen Fisher, you know, he's a very aggressive Winston player, and with that, that has just opened up all of this space for the Los Angeles Gladiators at DPS to really pour it on and kind of match that same aggression so now we're starting to see sure for and hydration uh really start to pop off for the gladiators and it's like it's been really fun to watch and at this point like do you think that out of these western teams that the gladiators are the team to beat when you like compare them to like the outlaws the fusion and the valiant um I want to jump on the bandwagon of the Gladiators. I don't know if... <laughs> I don't know if I can. Like, I really want to, but I still... I've seen so much eh out of them that I don't know if I can be like, yeah, let's all go ahead, go gung-ho on the Gladiator train when you have people like teams like the Valiant you have teams like the Outlaws uh, and not the Fuel. Um, you know, and the Fusion out there who I I personally think are probably better. Um, but it's hard to deny the results that the Gladiators are getting. So, I mean, right now, as tough as it is for me to say, Gladiators are probably probably the best NA team over the Outlaws and the Fusion and the Valiant. I don't think it's going to stay that way, but right now, I think they are ab above them. Yeah, for me, like I think it's between the two LA teams, and the Gladiators did just sweep the Valiant, so that was a huge exclamation point for me. So I do think the Gladiators are the team to beat, uh, at least in the West. You know, obviously they're not the top team in the league. Uh, you know, that is a toss-up between, you know, the three Korean teams being Seoul Dynasty, London Spitfire, and New cough, York, cough, New York. And, yeah, we'll we'll talk about, you know, what happened earlier on the <laughs> next show when we cover this current week. Uh, but, yeah, uh, New York uh, did pick up a pretty big win against one of the other Korean teams, so there is that. Uh, but I feel like... If teams aren't able to figure out how to deal with Fisher, then Asher, Sure4, and Hydration are just going to have all the space in the world to really work with. So, until someone can effectively shut down Fisher, I expect to see more of the same from the Gladiators. And, I mean, right now it doesn't look like they are going to slow down any. That aggression is doing wonders for this team. Um, I will say that uh, the one thing, I think the Overwatch League probably really loves the fact that the gladiators are becoming a, a little bit of a fan favorite because they have one of those characters on the team who fans adore and love who's also has no controversy around him in sure for like sure for is one of those i'm a lovable character everyone enjoys me i'm fun to be around i always have a good time and i don't have drama uh, and Overwatch League is probably like, this is what we needed all along. I don't want you to be ever become uh, part of the Dallas Fuel. So I, I will say I think the Gladiators being good are it's phenomenal for the actual Overwatch League. And it's always good to have, you know, a closer race between these teams in California as well, because for a while there, the Valiant were the odds-on favorite in all of those matches, whether it's the Battle of LA or just the Battle of California when they were facing the Shock. Uh, that being said, though, let's go ahead and preview uh, the rest of the matches from this week. So looking at Friday, we have the Los Angeles Gladiators taking on the Florida Mayhem. So 
you know, speaking of the Gladiators, you know, they are facing your team, the Mayhem. How do you think this one is going to uh, shape out here? All right, so I am a realistic Gladiator, uh, Mayhem fan. I, I think the Gladiators are going to win. <laughs> uh, I think they just pose such a problem for the Mayhem that it's probably going to be a 3-1. That would be my guess. Uh, maybe a four zero on the Gladiators' part. I just, I just don't think the the hot streak the Gladiators are on right now is going to be hard for a team that is at the bottom of the Overwatch League to overcome. Like a team like Shanghai, Spitfire, New York, Fusion, Outlaws, they could overcome the the Gladiators' hot streak, but teams like the Fuel, the Shock, the Mayhem, the Dragons, they're not going to be able to overcome the the hotness that is the Gladiators. So it's either going to be 3-1 or 4-0 in the Gladiators' uh, favor. Looking at that second match tomorrow, we have the London Spitfire taking on the San Francisco Shock. And, you know, I, I talked about Dante when we were mentioning Sinatra, but Dante's Tracer play has been very solid overall for the Shock. Uh, but he really hasn't had the same impact when he is going up against some of the top Tracers in the league. And it just so happens that facing the Spitfire, he is going to be going up against just that. Uh, we have seen the London defense kind of stand, like, standing through the test of time. Uh, basically dealing with some of the best offenses in the league. And I, you know, I think it's safe to argue that uh, they probably have the best defense in the Overwatch League right now. Mm -hmm. But when I when I look at this particular matchup, yes, London are heavy favorites. I think if you are looking at the Shock, the player to watch in this one is going to be Nefix. I expect London really uh, turn that aggression on the back line. So you're going to be looking at Nefix to deal for his supports on the D.Va. But if the Shock backline falters, or if the DPS is able to d Nefix quick, you know, this should be a pretty one-sided affair. And in this one, like, I think the Shock are going to get swept. I have Spitfire taking it for O. And really, like, I, I think the Shock DPS can only do so much, but they're just, they're outmatched in this particular uh, series. So gonna be a pretty dark day for the shock uh but you know wrapping up friday night we have the los angeles valiant taking on the boston uprising which you know we we've seen you know kareev you know he went from support to dps he's been doing pretty damn good on the uh the 76 so you know do you think that's gonna continue here against the uprising who have uh faltered just a little bit with the dive comp currently um yes I think it will continue. I do not see... Uh, how do I put this? The Uprising have either excelled or failed horribly. Um, I, I don't like the Uprising in this meta and this stage, personally. Um, when I've watched their matches, it's, become, it's, it's kind of lackluster. I don't see anything I truly like. Uh, I think Dream Casper has kind of uh, the high of him in round one is kind of, you know, worn off. Um, whereas, and uh, who was it? Kellex. Kellex on Lucio is possibly the most infuri It's Kellex on Lucio is as infuriating as Taimu on Winston for the Fuel fans. And deck on uh, Mercy. Yeah, it's just like, Kalex, <laughs> you're doing awesome on damage on Lucio, but you can't heal if your life depended on it. And your life literally depends on it. Like, your life in the game depends on you healing, not you doing damage. You need to get over that. And it's just, I don't think, they're the kings of 4-0s. 4-0s and 0-4s. Uh, I can't remember if this match this week, but up until this week, they have not played in a match where they haven't gone 0-4 or gone 4-0. and In this one, I'm going to continue that trend. I think they get 
Yeah, you know, Keldix has not adapted well uh, to the Lucio. He was really good on Mercy last stage, but it is night and day difference here with the Hero Switch and the meta swapping out. Alright, so looking at Saturday, we have another battle of the Juggernauts because we have the Soul Dynasty going up against the London Spitfire. So, I have to say, like, this week in particular for the Dynasty is without question the toughest week of the stage out of every Overwatch League team. You know, mm -hmm. They faced New York Excelsior earlier in the week, and then, you know, Saturday they faced the London Spitfire, and these two teams have played each other uh, last stage, and that one went in favor of the Spitfire, and they had swept the Dynasty 4-0. And, you know, kind of retreating back to what I was talking about with the defense for the Spitfire, it actually held the Dynasty to only two map objectives in that four-game series, both of which didn't come until map four in that series. So, really, no other team in the Overwatch League can say that they have done that to the Dynasty. So, you know, there is a lot of reasons to be concerned about this match if you are a Dynasty fan. So, uh, you know, uh, Spitfire, they're playing back-to-back -back days. But one of those games is against the Shock, which just means all of that prep time, or the vast majority of the prep time, is going to go towards this match against the Soul Dynasty. Whereas on the other side of the coin, you know, the Dynasty have to face both of the Korean teams. So are they going to play their B squad? Are they going to play their main starters? I, I, I don't know what we're going to see, but, like, coaching in the Overwatch League is really important, and if you're the Dynasty having to prepare for two different teams that have a very drastic play style, I don't feel very confident in how this one is going to shape out, just based off of what we have already seen against the Spitfire, because they didn't match up well, and that kind of goes back to even before the Overwatch League, with Lunatic High going up against Kondu Panthera, and you see Busan, who do make up the Spitfire roster, so... <laughs> I, I am hoping the Dynasty have figured it out. You know, they did take one of the two games against the New York Excels here. Spoilers, it was not this week. It was last stage. So I'm hoping maybe we can one-up the London Spitfire. But, you know, my gut tells me just based on preparation, London is going to take this one. I have this one... 3-1 to one in favor of the Spitfire. I don't think we're going to see another Game 5 out of the Dynasty this week. And it pains me to say that, but, you know... I was just I was just about to say, I'm like, how much does it hurt you to be like, I'm predicting Soul to go 0-2 this week? It's... <laughs> my, my, my two dads are fighting in this game. I have, a, I have both of these jerseys, so... I'm going to drape both of them over my shoulder, so... I, I, I don't know. But, like, it, it doesn't pain me that much, but, like, if it was another match and I was picking against Dynasty, then obviously I would feel a little bit more hurtful at that point. Uh, but I'm looking forward to this one. They're, like, the Dynasty NYXL game from this week was absolutely amazing. I can't wait to deep dive into that one on our next show. But, like, finishing off the week, we have the Shock taking on the Outlaw. So, Edinar, what do you have for this one? Okay, so, uh, spoiler alert, upset of the week on this one. Um, I am, I'll just say right out, I think Shock win this one 3-2. I, I know Shock have been mm, iffy at best, but so have the Outlaw. The Outlaws need that, like, they have not looked good. They had to struggle to come back and, and fight the Mayhem, uh, which, as a Mayhem fan, hurts me to say that they had to struggle to beat, to beat them. But, I mean, they really did. I mean, you get 4 0 by the Valiant last week as well, and then you get 4 0 by New York before that. And you get beat by the Fusion before that. Houston is on a legit losing streak right now. And I think all the rah-rah, sis boom ba that Jake brings to this is not going to be enough. I think they need to... I don't think they're going to 
do a comeback against a team that is worse than them, slash closer to them than you think, I think they'll have their rah rah sis boom ba moment against a better team. Uh, like, oh God, when's the next time? Oof, who did they even play coming up? Uh, I don't think they're going to beat the whole dynasty or, oh, this could be a rough time for the, the Houston all off fans. Uh, but I still think Houston will lose. I think no tracer and Jake on tracer is fine and dandy, but he's just, it's not what he's meant to be on. And clockwork is fine on tracer, but again, he's not what you want to see out of tracer. They don't have a tracer. Their best tracer is a character is a player who has not played yet in the overwatch league. And that's Mendo. And Mendo is so up and down that you can't actually legitimately play him on Tracer. Like, if anything, I say Houston's going to be like, all right, uh, San Francisco, what do you want for Dante? We'll give you really anything for Dante. Just give him to us. Uh, and I think that's going to be their downfall. It's just no Tracer play in, in this matchup and no one to counter Dante on his Tracer. and. I just, I have no, like, sound, like, hey, San Francisco is better than Houston, other than my gut feeling is saying that they're going to lose. So, going with that. Houston's going to lose probably 3-2, maybe 3-1. Well, to to kind of talk about the Tracer play for a moment, I, I would argue that the best Tracer player for Houston isn't even on the Outlaws. It is on their Academy team. But that player's only 16, so there, there is that. But yeah, you know, Mendo is still waiting to be freed. You know, he's on bench duty. Hashtag bench boys. Uh, but the, tra- Tracer, yeah, Tracer m- might be the undoing for the uh, the Owls, kind of like has it been for pretty much all of Stage 2. And it's really been interesting. Like, they have tried to kind of run the anti-dive at times, which worked really great in Stage 1 for the Outlaws hasn't had the same success in stage two with the current meta so i don't know it's really it's really hard to like feel very confident in the outlaws all of the pieces are there except tracer and it just shows how important tracer is right now uh but like, no matter no matter what comp you have in overwatch one spot is guaranteed for tracer like no matter what you run dive you run anti-dive you run any form of comp in any map in Overwatch, you need a Tracer. You start with Tracer and build your team around that. And Houston didn't do that. Yep, and uh, yeah, last match for the week, we have Dallas Fuel going up against the Philadelphia Fusion. So, uh, are the Fuel going down in a blaze of glory? No, it's, it's more of a whimper. Uh, so... I mean, I'll be honest, like, look, guys, the fuel are struggling. The tank synergy is not there. They keep trying to throw AKM on Genji, despite having Rascal on the roster, which we talked about earlier. The alt usage <laughs> the alt usage by the support line has been very suspect at best, which pains me. And there just really isn't a whole lot going right with the Dallas Fuel roster as a whole right now. Looking at the Fusion, I know uh, earlier in the week we got to see Snillo in the lineup for the Fusion, and I think regardless of what DPS duo that we see between, you know, EQO, Shadowburn, Snillo, whoever that player is that's going to be on the projectile or the tracer is going to be able to farm their ultimates on Taimu when he dives early. So I just look at this and I, I look at the Fusion aggression and I just think it's going to be too much for Dallas to handle. I don't think Dallas will take a map in this series. I have the Fusion taking it 4-0. And, you know, the Fuel are going to be looking ahead at Stage 3 at this point. You know, there's no way they're going to make a comeback in Stage 2. They've had a very lackluster season overall. And hopefully, uh, the murmurs about OGE and account boosting that are unconfirmed don't actually come out to be true, because if that is the case, they might not have a main tank outside of Taimu for quite some time. But, you know, 
That's unconfirmed, so we don't know whether or not that is the case, so take that with a grain of salt. But, you know, our game of the week, you know, out of these two days... It, it, it can only be one game, and that is the showdown between the Dynasty and the Spitfire. If that is anything like the Dynasty NYXL game that we saw earlier this week... Oh, it's gonna be epic. It's gonna be a barn burner, so don't miss that one here on Saturday. I mean, I, I feel the Gladiator's Mayhem should be a better game, but I'll give it to you that the Dynasty Spitfire should be game of the week. Absolutely, and we did actually send out a question of the week this week that we will uh, share your answers about now. We asked, with back-to-back -back support hero releases, which role would you like to see filled by Hero 28? And uh, we got a few answers from our Discord, so Edinar, why don't you go ahead and take the first couple ones, and then I will take over for the last bit. All right, uh, so our first one is from Blink. Uh, honestly, we need a defense here. Someone with some kind of zone area control that feels new, fairly justified. Uh, you, you're going to see a running theme here. So then we also got something from Shrug on Discord. Uh, defense hero, please. And then <laughs> repaired I-56. We need defense. Uh, so you see a, a common denominator there. Well, uh, we're going to shake it up. We have Invictus saying, yeah, no defense heroes. They need a strong tank to be added. One that can force Winston's usage down. Not sure how, but it's what I would like to see. Cypher says, I would like to see a new tank, but no more shields, please. Also could see another DPS, but a consistent DPS, no flanker with just high burst damage. <laughs> and, uh, you know, kind of continuing that theme. Not Rob uh, from Omnic Lab says, I'd like to see another mobile tank, to be honest, to compete with D.Va. And I thought that was interesting because we had... What, one of the uh, content creators saying, okay, we want something a bit more mobile to force Winston's usage down, and then Rob comes in and says, no, we, we, we want Difa's usage to come down a little bit to keep her honest. And, you know, I think no matter what side of the coin you're on, both of those tanks are pretty much must-picks in most situations right now. Mm -hmm. Outside of, well, even in, like, triple tank. I mean, we still pretty much see that, too, so... Oh, I mean, dive doesn't seem to be going anywhere, so, you know, another aggressive type dive tank could be something that we use. I, I don't mean, think I don't think anyone wants to see Barrier Watch, though, so I don't think we're no, going to need another shield with tank. With Brigette, or however you pronounce it, uh, that's supposed to be getting rid of the dive, so hopefully, by default, getting rid of the Tracer or Genji diving in, you get less Winston Divas. I mean, it's wishful thinking, but it's possible. <laughs> well, I am still going to play Tracer, regardless. <laughs> Whether or not Brigitte shuts me down, I don't know. Uh, but uh, we don't have any reviews this week, so that will lead us to our shout out. So, Edinar, is there anyone out there that you want to uh, shout out this week before we close out the show? Um, I don't think I have really any shout outs other than, you know, uh, to the Floyd of Mayhem. Uh, keep the good times rolling. <laughs> that's what I, that's what I want to shout out. Keep it going. And then I'll give you the finger guns. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, uh, for me, I have to give a shout out to another Overwatch podcast out there that is unfortunately. Uh, going on a perma hiatus, and that is Overcast. This is a general Overwatch podcast that was hosted by my good friend Frosty Fox, as well as Overdrive. And, you know, I've been following them for a while, actually. Uh, won one of their uh, World Cup prediction challenges that they did, like a bracket challenge. Well, and you, won, you won a, an Overwatch prediction thing? Like I know. You it's, have it's stage it one, is, you're winning it, stage two. It's astounding, you know? I know. <laughs> But, uh, I mean, the only reason why I won it, though, is because Slambo wasn't in that one. Slambo won our oh, okay. personal one because he kind of swept the board. But, you know, I've, I've been ahead of him throughout the entire Overwatch League, so th there is also that. So. Hashtag better than Slambo. <laughs> and, you know, Spider hashtag forever third. Uh, so Overcast, you know, really sad to see it go. We've seen a multitude of some of the more, like, long-going Overwatch podcasts start to... Uh, 
deplete at this point. But, you know, with the Overwatch League, we've seen kind of a, a resurgence of esports podcasts, which is also great. So it kind of balances each other out. But, you know, general Overwatch podcasts are few and far between now, which is definitely sad to see. But that will lead us to the point where we need to close out the show. So, Edinar, why don't you go ahead and let people know where they can get a hold of us over on social media and our email and all that good stuff. Okay, so you can reach us on email at hndoverwatch at gmail.com. Uh, you can reach us on Twitter at hndoverwatch. Uh, Twitch, where we stream live on Twitch at uh, www.twitch.tv slash OWLN show. Uh, we do three shows. So you have the OWLN uh, on Monday at 7 p.m. Uh, Pacific. Then you have OWL in the back cap Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Pacific. And then, obviously, Heroes Never Die, the best of the three, uh, on Thursdays at 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, you can also reach us on Discord at discord.me slash OWLN show. And then we have a thriving YouTube channel, so Overwatch League Network. So we're getting close to our custom URL. So we really just want people to go out there, subscribe to our channel, uh, we want to get enough subscribers so we can get our own personal URL. Um, so it's less like, you know, come find us on our YouTube.com slash 145897264. Yeah, 22 and we characters. Can customize later. it uh, to, so it's easier for people to find. So come out there and, you know, subscribe, watch our videos. Uh, now, me personally, you can find me on Twitter at Adenar Overwatch on Twitter. Uh, Totem, where can they find you? Well, I'm over on Twitter at CTR. I also never stream on my other <laughs> Twitch, but if you want to follow me on Twitch, you absolutely can at twitch.tv slash drunk. But if I am streaming, guys, chances are it will be on this channel, twitch.tv slash OWLN show and you know just talking about you know Twitch for a second we are only missing the follower account in order to get affiliate so I think we need like 15 or 16 more and then you know we could go out we can make our own emote for the channel the and people, it's people a Florida can mayhem it. no it's we're gonna go Florida mayhem it's absolutely not Florida mayhem yes. if I have anything to say about it it's not happening <laughs> It'll be something OWLN related. I don't know what yet, but we will get to that when we get to it. But, you know, we're really close on that and the YouTube URL. So any help you guys can do would be greatly appreciated. But for now, guys, that is going to do it for us here tonight on Heroes Never Die. Again, this has been episode 102. And that is getting to be a mouthful because of how long we've been going. Uh, but now You guys have been going on like this show has been one of the first like overwatch podcasts i ever listened to this in the cavalry mm -hmm. i'm impressed and amazed how long this has been going on it, i'm glad to be a part of it it's been a grind and it only goes up from here <laughs> uh but guys again that will do it for us so we will be back here on monday night for overwatch league network obviously recapping the past week or this current week actually if, if you're listening to it this week which you probably will be <laughs> So be sure to tune in then and again on Wednesday for the back cap, which is covering contenders and the tier two scene. So if you guys want updates on the Academy teams from the Overwatch League, look no further than the back cap. But we will see you guys back here next week. Have a good night. Yep, have a good one. Thank you for listening to Heroes Never Die. Be sure to follow us on Twitter I can at stop HND and Overwatch and join us on Discord at discord.me slash OWLN show.